good morning, everybody, and welcome to our power session. Uh, the topic that we're going to be talking about this morning is one that uh, has, has generated a lot of interest, a lot of excitement at the NAB show this year. We'll be talking about open standards that drive industry innovation, and in particular, we're going to be focused on the Ames Alliance. Joining me today, we have a, a number of uh, gentlemen from the Ames organization. Brian Bedford, the Global Business Development Partner in Sports Media and Entertainment Ecosystems from Cisco. Thanks. We've got Mike Kronk, who is the Vice President of Core Technology at Grass Valley and also the Chairman of the Ames Alliance. We have Benoit Fevrier, uh, who recently made the transition from CTO of, uh, EV, uh, of EVS to be the SVP of products and markets. And we have uh, Bob Seidel from CBS, the Vice President of Engineering and Advanced Technology for the network. Thank you. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me this morning. So I wanted to start off with a quick overview of what is Ames. So Ames is the Alliance for IP Media Solutions. It's an organization that was founded in December and has grown rapidly to become one of the leading voices in the IP uh, uh, transition activities. Ames is a trade alliance. It's a not-for-profit trade alliance. It's open to anyone that wants to join. And in fact, if there's anyone here who's interested, you can go to amesalliance.org. The bylaws are available on the internet. The applications are available on the internet. And anyone that is interested is certainly welcome to join us in the alliance. It is 100% funded by the members. Uh, the funding that is uh, brought into the Ames organization is used primarily for education and marketing events. And it's formed around a common goal. That common goal is to foster the adoption of one set of common, ubiquitous, and standards-based protocols for interoperability over IP for the media and entertainment industry. We really formed this alliance to try to avoid fragmentation within the industry as the IP transition is happening. So the group of companies that you see represented here and that you see represented by the alliance overall made the decision that we wanted to rally around a single set of standards. Those standards are being developed by technical organizations such as the VSF and NMI, being standardized through the SDO process of SMPTE, EBU, and the AES, and then being published into reference architectures by groups like the Joint Task Force for Network Media, the EBU, and the VSF. These are the organizations that develop the standards that will drive our industry forward. And the role of trade alliances like Ames is to adopt those standards and foster the adoption of that to avoid fragmentation within the standards realm. So who are the members of Ames? Well, we have about 30 companies now, including several that we announced just this week, including Bob's company, uh, CBS, and we've also been joined by 20th Century Fox. So we have uh, a growing base of both equipment manufacturers from the broadcast industry and the IT side, and we uh, have some users that are now part of the Ames Alliance. The roadmap that has been put in place for Ames really starts with SMPTE 2022-6. This is the standard that governs the use of uncompressed video over IP. And in fact, it shares a common payload format with SDI. This <coughs> gives us the ability to move seamlessly back and forth across IP and SDI-based systems to create hybrid environments. When you add into that AES 67, you then have the ability to manage discrete audio streams. So instead of using audio that's embedded in 2022, you now break that out into a discrete essence. And this is really what's described in VSF TR04, a model that uses 2022 for video essence, AES67 for audio essence, and then uh, SMPTE 2059 as the reference timing model. One further improvement in that roadmap is the migration towards VSF TRO3. TRO3 relies on RFC 4175 for video. This gives us the benefit of moving away from the SDI framing and it eliminates all of the overhead 
that was part of the SDI protocol. In TRO3, what you have is a purely native IP model. Video in 4175, audio in AES67, metadata being carried in SMPTE 291, and everything under a single common timing reference model described by SMPTE 2059. We believe that this provides the standards basis for interoperability between all of the equipment that's used in the production and origination markets. So gentlemen, I'd like, to open up, uh, I'd like to open up a discussion about Ames. I'd like to talk a little bit about why each of your companies feels like this is the right approach and what you're doing to foster adoption of this common set of standards. So Bob, let's start with you. You're, you're coming at this from the <laughs> standpoint of, of an end user. Yes. Um, We've always believed that open standards ensure that our content can be distributed to the widest possible uh, distribution mechanisms that exist. CBS, not, uh, everyone thinks of CBS as a broadcaster, but indeed we're global. So we're distributing our content not only domestically, but internationally. And therefore having a common open standard that works on a global scale is very important. Benoit, how about you? What is EVS doing? As you know, EVS is a leading provider of video server for live production. So we have been one of the early adopters of uh, IP for video production. So we have been working with uh, 2022 for a while right now, and, uh, and everything is working fine. The good thing we have in Europe is we have a few projects uh, led by uh, TV uh, implementing new uh, IP production. Um, Especially, I would like to mention one, which is the VRT IP Life project, where EBS is involved, and also many other companies. And today, what I can say is that project is working well with 2022-6 implementation. So IP is a reality today. And that project uh, with VRT we, we will go live over the next months for a real production full IP. So what we are doing right now in that project is implementing also AS67, which is the only path for us for the next step of implementation. So that means for EVS, there is only one option, and that option is TRO3, AS67, openness, and standard. There is no other options, and this is already what we are working on right that's, now. So it's an all-in strategy. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Mike, you're, you're wearing two hats on this yeah. panel, as I mentioned. You're, you're both uh, representing Grass Valley, but also the chairman of the Ames Alliance. So I'll give you a couple of extra seconds if you want to say something about both of those. So I'll start with uh, Grass Valley. We've, over the last uh, few years, really following our customers and their desires to move to IP, uh, to be able to virtualize and get a additional flexibility and agility in their business. From a product strategy perspective, we've had made a heavy investment in IP in all our product lines. And so that's kind of a foundational thing for, for Grass Valley. But as we looked at the industry, particularly even uh, working into last year, there was, as Steve mentioned, quite a bit of fragmentation. There were a lot of uh, proprietary uh, proposals uh, out there. And so from a customer-based perspective, what that yields is confusion. Uh, and, and so it was, we looked at that, and, and this is also kind of the, the genesis of Ames, if you will. There's this one very powerful and fundamental idea. And that is in a network, you need a standard that everybody can share, that's common, that's ubiquitous, and that wherever I go, in any country, I can plug in and, and I know how it works. If you have that, commerce flourishes. Uh, companies are able to thrive, uh, people are able to move, and, 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 we, and we saw that there was really a stall and a waiting in the industry because there, there was no, uh, you know, a common approach to standards. The irony of that is there's been, there was excellent work going on in AMWA and DSF, which recommend uh, things to SMPTE, and then SMPTE working on standardization. So we had a standard, it was just that the industry was fragmented around that. So the, really the genesis of AIMS was really to become the standards organization's, in essence, biggest cheerleader, and to, and to help foster that adoption. And so it made total sense from a business uh, perspective for, for Grass Valley, I think for the industry as, as we move, so that we can uh, really uh, position ourselves well against you know, existential threats of competition and, and whatnot throughout. But the other aspect really was a cost aspect. It costs money to do every single standard known to man and just do anything. It costs the customers money, the end users, because then they have to make all this stuff work and it creates a lot of headaches. So it just made so much sense 
in so many directions that we rally around this powerful and simple idea that we need a standard for the network. Brian, you're coming at this from a slightly different point of view, Cisco, you know, which is, is a, large, uh, a large player in the IT segment. Why did you get interested and why is Cisco involved in what we're doing with Ames? Yeah, I think Cisco's had a history of looking for market transitions. That's kind of been something that we've done uh, going back for 25 years. And um, it, you know, if you use an analogy to where, let's say, IP telephony was at 10 to 15 years ago, it's a similar uh, kind of leap forward, sure. right? Um, and so um, this is certainly something that we're, we're very supportive of. Um, Cisco's a big believer in openness, open standards. Um, that's kind of built into the DNA of our company. Um, and we also believe that partnerships are key to that. And so Ames is a bit of a compelling event for Cisco um, yeah. in that it, it allows us to also reallocate resources to support the partner community that we need um, and the industry needs together to uh, work together to build systems, right? So um, from my perspective, representing kind of how we look at things from a market segment and a partnering aspect, you know, Ames comes at a really good time. Um, the other piece of this is, is um, Cisco's, you know, kind of doubling down into the media segment as a whole, right? And so many of the press, the announcements with NBC, the other things that have come out this week, are about Cisco really launching what we're calling the Cisco Media Blueprint. And all of the standards that Steve, that you went through, those are all part of the underlining kind of interoperable standards. And we're doing virtualization work with literally every one of these uh, customers or partners on the panel here, or we're working on uh, systems to, or hooks to build into those systems because we believe that that's what the industry needs as we move forward. Well, I think everybody's seen the announcements that you're talking about, and it's clear that Cisco is becoming very active in this segment. Um, but I, I think people would like to hear about some real-world examples. Sure. What kinds of things are you guys really working on now? Well, one that's familiar, certainly, um, last year you guys uh, announced the ABC Disney project, right? Play out with Versio, um, leveraging Cisco UCS. Uh, you know, there are a number of... Uh, projects right now um, in, in deployment. We're working on uh, one, as we referenced, uh, you know, the press release with the NBC. Um, there are a number of uh, uh, active, uh, and really for the last, I would say, six to 12 months, there have been active POCs really around the world um, with many of our companies. Um, Benoit referenced one that are happening, and there is deep engineering working work happening um, at a number of projects that will go live as we get into the summer and as we get into the fall that, again, a number of us will be involved in. So quite exciting. We see, um, ver the, we see a big virtualization play or data center play happening with most every major broadcaster um, around the world. Um, and so, um, we're, again, we're certainly seeing it come maybe a little bit more into our wheelhouse as our core technology. And so we've got to embrace this community, and we're here, and, and the reason why we're committed to joining AIMS is because we want the industry to know that we're committed to the industry, we're committed to supporting it, we're committed to um, sitting on um, the technical working groups of AIMS, the marketing working groups of AIMS, we have active participation because we believe that if we don't, we can't just be a passive bystander in this industry. We have to play an active role. Benoit, you, uh, you mentioned that you've got some uh, POC activity and even some deployments going on too. Why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what, what EVS has been doing? Yeah, so w when we look at projects uh, involving IP right now, uh, what we see is uh, only few projects uh, implementing IP from, from scratch. We, uh, we have to mix SDI implementation together with IP. And one of the issues is uh, how to manage the uh, hybrid integration between IP and SDI. So this is one of the challenge of uh, IP transition, how to bridge between IP uh, and SDI uh, integration. Also, sometimes the customers has to manage uh, UHD and HD implementation while they are moving to uh, HD, SDI to IP. So imagine if you have also two standards to implement, one IP standard and another one, that is uh, making complicated the integration even more. So we, uh, I have already uh, met some customers doing that trade show, or maybe in the past months, asking already to, to maybe convert between two IP implementation and come on. I think this is not an option. Uh, we, uh, we have so many uh, challenges to tackle, 
I think we, have to, we need to have one IP integration because we have to manage many other uh, challenges uh, for the integration. Okay. So, um, as you said, I think the, uh, the concrete implementation, the POC, uh, using the openness, using the CMT and VSF implementation is really important. So, we, uh, you can see uh, on the floor at NAB many uh, implementation of AIMS. We have a special one uh, at the EDS booth. Um, so, as I said, we are already 2022-6 uh, compliant. We have also uh, uh, the beginning of an AS67 uh, implementation. So, on, on our booth, we have a Grass Valley camera outputting IP. We have also an image and communication Selenio uh, converter. We have also LAVO, uh, AIMS compliant uh, stuff. Uh, and then we have two Cisco uh, switch just to uh, show how we can manage the content traffic between two sides. And also something we have to bear in mind is we need to manage the, the switch uh, in a dynamic way. We need to reserve bandwidth. We need to uh, use SDN, open flow. And also, I, I think there are many challenges to tackle. Uh, the interoperability, uh, the way the, the system has to work together, the way you manage your system, always the, the smart stuff, etc., etc. So uh, we will succeed only if we have live implementation, if we have concrete implementation, and I think we started already months ago, and we have many concrete implementation on that floor. That means we are in the right direction. And trust me, we are reused to implement many standards. So this is really the only way to go up to EVS. So you, you mentioned hybrid is one of the strategies that you're using to move in this direction. Bob, are you guys also looking at, at hybrid as a way to migrate towards IP? Absolutely. We have a huge installed plant of HDSDI, both in New York and Hollywood at our production centers. So as we get into IP, we're definitely looking for a hybrid solution because we will have both operating for many years because of just the depreciation cycle of equipment. But as you go forward and look at new implementations, you can see some of the advantages that IP has. Um, when we look at our business, um, let me put on my SIMPTI hat for a second. Sure. Um, at SIMPTI, as president of the SIMPTI, we really advocate the standards process and having open standards that everyone can contribute and participate in, and therefore we get a better product on the output side. An example of this is our, international, our intermediate mastering format, IMF, which is now being adopted uh, globally. It was originally a uh, developed by SIMPTI with a lot of work from some of the Hollywood studios, Disney and others, and now it's being embraced by the OTT market, such as Netflix. Right. So this is a prime example of how SIMPTI and our OPERT standards process ensure that there's, there, it's an easy way to migrate content uh, from one location to another. Um, a lot of people don't realize that entertainment content in the United States is our third largest export behind foods and guns and airplanes. So it is a very important export for this country and therefore having the ability to seamlessly uh, migrate via IP to this uh, new standard is very important. Um, uh, each year we generate billions of dollars of revenue by uh, taking our content that is domestically originated and uh, selling it throughout the uh, world. So having common standards is very, very important to CBS to facilitate our business. There's also some work going on in SIMPTI that pertains to the work we're doing at Ames, isn't there? Yes, uh, the SIMPTI standard, while not yet released, will be uh, 2110, which will be actually a family of standards. And uh, that uh, some of the initial work from uh, TRO 3 and 04 is serving as a good baseline to continue and finalize the, uh, the SIMPTI standard. So uh, we're working very hard with uh, the organizations and we encourage everyone to participate on the SIMPTI technical committees because that's how we get a, a better standard. So we should all get used to saying 2110, right? 2110, yes, okay. it's a new buzzword. Uh, <laughs> So, so, Mike, um, why don't you tell us all a little bit about what Grass Valley has been doing in terms of uh, the, the AIMS adoption. Yeah, so uh, just to also follow on your last question about implementations and, and sure. the number of. Um, so within AIMS, uh, recently it was a few weeks back, so we're not counting all the members that, that we have now that have recently joined. Um, but we did a count of, of how many uh, multi-vendor sites 
have implemented Ames technology, and it was about 80 sites uh, worldwide. So that's a fairly yeah. impressive number. So this technology is is real, uh, and it's happening. And and from a Grass Valley perspective, I uh, we're, we're doing a lot of, of that, and I think we're going to see uh, more you know following from the show. But I wanted to just draw attention to one example, which I think uh, illustrates the power of of what IP can do and 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 the Ames technology itself. And that's an installation uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, now called uh, NEP uh, Netherlands, used to be uh, Dutch View or Infostrata. But what they've done is they've used uh, SMPTE 2022-6 in a multi-vendor uh, uh, configuration. So uh, Grass Valley uh, cameras, Lavo, Audio, uh, SAM has product in there as, as well. Uh, and they've been able to put the cameras at the stadium. Uh, Grass Valley has a camera with, with uh, an, what we call IP Direct. So there is no uh, CCU base station in the facility. So that's all virtualized back in a central location, production switcher in a central location, and they are doing uh, basically remote production uh, with only the cameras in, in a studio or facility. Uh, and so IP has allowed them not only just to replace SDI, but to open up an entirely new uh, business model. And that's really the power of, of what this is about. That's a really good point. So uh, Brian, what do you see as being kind of the key benefits that customers are gonna get out of this? Well, we're certainly seeing you know great efficiency and and lower cost of ownership. I mean, that's kind of a, a long long term, right? The the that also leads to massive amounts of flexibility, right? We all know we're we're we historically built systems for capacity, right? And now with IP, we have the ability to flex the network or flex uh, a data center environment, right? To be able to. Uh, provide some orchestration or, or whatnot. So I think, you know, when you look at it very simply, right, total cost of ownership should uh, should ultimately decrease, um, massive flexibility, um, but certainly you can't do that without interoperability, right? And sure. so um, it requires all of us to, you know, lock arm in arm, be here for the industry, um, understand the trends and where things are going. Um, so, I mean, I think in short, uh, that's kind of how we look at it now. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's, that's why we've made the commitment we've done, because it certainly plays to the things that Cisco's been doing for a long time. But in order to get there, I'm sure there are still some problems that have to be solved. Bob, what do you look at as being the challenges that are still in front of Ames? What are the areas that you think uh, still need to be advanced in terms of true interoperability? Um, I, I think making sure that we can transition from SDI to IP uh, seamlessly is going to be very important. Looking at delays uh, and then looking to see if we can bring all of the services that we have in IP uh, through the IP, uh, through SDI, through the IP pipeline. So uh, just being able to transition back and forth because we're going to be in both of these worlds for, for some time to come. So having a uh, seamless transition between the two is very important. Mike, I'm going to ask you the same question. Well, what, what's the technical working group working on right now? What, what are the things that they're looking at trying to solve? Yeah, well, that, that's an excellent uh, question, Stephen. And, and, I, and I have to say, in, in the four months that Ames has existed, most all the members have commented on how the technical working group has been probably the most collaborative thing that they've ever been involved with with broadcast in terms of interventor, which we're sharing information, what we're really about is, is implementation. So there's an implementation challenge, right? There, there's technical recommendations from VSF, uh, as Bob mentioned, so those are in SIMTI now in the final uh, uh, you know, throws of standardization. And so now, more than ever, it's, it's an intensely critical time. Uh, in parallel, uh, multiple companies, the companies that you see up, up here and, and others and part of the Ames Alliance are implementing uh, TRO3. And, and there's a lot of detail in, in, like as Bob is saying, preserving latency, uh, inner packet jitter, how is that going to look, and all these various uh, details that uh, we're able to share information on, understand, excuse me, understand, uh, and then make uh, improvement recommendations uh, and, and ensure that the implementation is not only that we get there in, in a timely manner, but it's correct and it works extremely well because that's absolutely critical for adoption. So I would just make a shameless plug if, if you're a corporation out, out there, a company that's, that's interested in jumping on I, IP, there's probably never a better time to, to join Ames and, and get in on that, that party to understand what's going on and be ready uh, when the transition really accelerates. So that, that eventual transition to TRO3, I think, is what, what we're all working for. Uh, and 
And Mike and I were actually at a press event yesterday morning and somebody asked the question of when. So I, I like to get opinions from, from each of our panelists and uh, Brian, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Bob, I'm just gonna go ahead and start with you. When do you think w there will be either an, uh, a direct need for or an implementation of, you can take it from the customer's point of view or the, the technology point of view, um, of, uh, of 2110? Yeah, I think already I'm seeing people looking to build mobile units that utilize this. Uh, we're looking at uh, origination facilities that will utilize uh, 2110. Uh, but again, we're going to have to solve the problem of going back and forth between the two worlds. But And you think that that back and forth lasts for a couple of years? Yes, I, I think people have invested in HDSDI uh -huh. and they're not going to throw that investment out. But obviously when they look at building new facilities, they're going to need to bridge between the two of them. Um, IP has definite advantages in terms of uh, set up the amount of signals it can carry, but I think you also have to think about training your staff too. That's a good point. So it's not just uh, worrying about the technology, you have to look at training your staff and SIMPTI has been helping to do that with some of our uh, continuing education programs to uh, give people CCNA accreditation. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have to worry about implementing the technology, but you have to make sure that you bring your people along, your maintenance people, your operators, and your engineers, so they're at a, 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 an even playing field to deal with the technology. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point, and it's one that I think we probably don't talk enough about yet, but um, probably should talk yes. more about. Uh, Benoit, you're already doing some stuff actively in the field, so when do you see really, truly interoperable TRO3 implementations being a reality? So I think um, on a requirement perspective, the when is now because we uh, we met we met customers asking for uh, real implementation with IP. So I, I should say if we had aims ready right now on a standard perspective and, and on a technical perspective, uh, I I could maybe mention customers ready to implement it. But uh, Robert mentioned IMF, and uh, I used to work on IMF for a long time. And I think for each uh, standard which is complicated, like IMF or EMS, yeah. we have to be ready to go step by step. Mm. Actually, I think I've been working on IMF for maybe 10 <laughs> years, uh, and we are still working on IMF. We are still working on standard implementation. And uh, like in any uh, industry, we start by having the video working, and then the audio, and then the metadata, and then the cross caption, and then maybe the PTP. So I think we have to remain humble. We have to go step by step. Yeah. And this is what we did actually already with 2022-6. And it's working because we mentioned projects, few projects yeah. already implementing. And then we have to be humble. And one of the messages I would like to convey is we have no time to, uh, to struggle against <coughs> manufacturers. Let's work together. We have yeah. business perspective, but also we have customers we have to serve. And our customers is asking IP right now because they all understand most of them are smart and they all understand the benefit of IP and the benefits of using codes and IT infrastructure in their, in their industry. So time to market is now, but step by step because we need to that's, continue providing the right services. That's a great message. Uh, Mike, what do you think? What's, what's the timing for it? Yeah, so I, I think as, as people have said, 2020-6, AD installations worldwide, it's really yeah. kind of in the can from a technology perspective and, and, and we can uh, distribute that today. Uh, from a TRO3 perspective, um, we're, we're targeting to have uh, deployments in the second half of this year. Uh, so we have technology on our, our booth right now that is, is doing the, the components of TRO3 like RFC 4175, AS67 and interoperating. Uh, that's not some kind of throwaway show code, that's the actual uh, real modules that we're gonna be deploying in our product. Uh, and we're fortunate uh, in the industry also to have VSF, uh, who is sponsoring different interoperability uh, type of things, so we, we plan to participate in those heavily. Uh, and as anything, there's, there's, there's new territory, it's new technology, there's hurdles to have, but uh, that's, that's where we're targeting and, and we're bullish about uh, having implementations at the latter end of this year. Brian, the question's a little bit different for Cisco because you guys are working not only on the UCS and the, the computing platforms that all of this runs on top of, but also on the networking right. side. So, so how do you see that coming together yeah. and, and when will it be ready? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's the summer and, and, and through the fall, right, to, to Mike's point. So I think 
Um, you know, certainly uh, there's been you know a, a lot of work relative to the virtualization work, and that's been going on for um, you know a number, arguably a couple of years now, relative to the broadcast market. So the, you know, no surprise there. But um, we've, we've you know, you'll see in our booth today our 9200 series uh, Nexus switch. Uh, and our spine leaf architecture that we're, um, you know, really trying to educate the market on what we're doing and, and all the things that everyone on this panel has kind of referenced. The one, so I think the timing is, you know, now, basically, um, and I think we've all kind of addressed that so far. The one thing that I would point out, and, I, uh, and, and um, Bob made a good point about education and the need for education, and, and I would also point to doing um, all of this um, transition also requires a deep commitment from the industry around services. And I think, um, you know, we're certainly seeing projects that are coming out now where they're, uh, they're asking many of you guys to say, we want, um, we, we, need a, we need one throat to choke. And we need to make sure that <laughs> you, we understand the network component, we understand the virtualization component, and, and that you have a partner to back up. Yeah. So it's not like we're abandoning you. But, but I think there's, there's, there's got to be a heavy commitment and, and resource around services. Because I think, especially early on in the infancy, what we're dealing with here, right, the, the customers are going to require a, a higher degree of um, uh, work and, and skilled labor, right, to, to make sure that that happens without any hitches. Uh, Bob made the comment of, you know, making the transition without any hiccups or any problems. And I certainly believe that, you know, education and services really round out the, the great technical work that we're doing, but services have to be part of this. That's great. Uh, so it sounds like there's consensus, uh, and I think Imagine would agree as well that we'll, we'll probably have TRO3 ready to go into the field second half of this year, maybe even uh, some, some interoperability demos at IBC yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, so let's, let's wrap up. Um, and in order to do that, I would like to give each of our panelists an opportunity to, to bring up one key takeaway, right? So for the folks that are sitting here listening today, um, what's the one thing that they should really think of, the one thing that they should really uh, concentrate on as they consider their adoption of AIMS or how industry standards are really going to help us all move forward? So Mike, you're the, you're the chairman, so you get to go first. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot I could say. I try to pick, pick one. So I, I think one thing is, as you know, we, we are uh, seeking within AIMS to galvanize around a standards-based approach. Uh, there are still other approaches uh, out there, and so as, as, as you engage as, as an end user, uh, as, as a technology partner uh, with, with the industry and the people that, that you're talking to, I think I really ask, ask the question of why not a standards-based approach? And I think in that, in that sense, uh, one of the things that, that really to, this, to distinguish between is within our industry, uh, SIMTI is a you know, recognized standards body, and, and there's something called a SIMTI standard, and there's something else, and it's called a SIMTI RDD, a Registered Disclosure Document. And that's a very uh, powerful and important thing because that allows a company to take something that's proprietary and say, here it is, I'm, I'm documenting what it is so somebody else can use it. However, that is not a standard. Uh, it doesn't have the same longevity. It's not going to stand the test of time. Uh, and I think there's a lot of confusion in the industry about that. And so to be educated on that point and understand the difference that there's a, a, a vast difference between a SIMTI standard and a SIMTI RDD, uh, and, and then to use that in, in, in the dialogue to, to help point people towards a real standards-based approach, which will have the legs and the longevity that this industry needs. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, so, Bob, voice of the customer, what's the one thing that you would say people should think of? I think as broadcasters and content producers, we compete on the content basis. We don't want to compete on a technology basis. When I look back at, over history, in the early days of one-inch videotape, you had type A, type B, and finally people said enough is enough, and the SMPTE type C standard was adopted, and that became a common platform for making content and storing content. And I can cite many examples where we don't flourish when we have different standards we flourish when we have a common platform to exchange our content and distribute our content. That's where we make money, and that's where I think it's beneficial for the entire industry because manufacturers don't have to support multiple versions and flavors. There becomes one common interchange process, and that is so essential 
to uh, a business opportunity. So. Yeah, yeah, I see a lot of heads nodding, so I think you're, you're hitting the right yeah. point. Uh, Benoit, what do you think? What, what's your one key takeaway? I think this is more or less the same perspective, but on the, on the vendor uh, implementation, I think the only option is AIMS right now for the IP implementation. And I can already say, say in front of you that EVS will be committed to AIMS uh, for the implementation, but also we will put all the effort for the VTrans SIMT uh, uh, interop implementation just to ensure that uh, everything works well. Um, I fully agree. Uh, we, uh, we have an amazing opportunity having all the customers, all the vendors working together into a group. That doesn't happen so often. And I think uh, we might be competitors sometime, but when you sit down engineers, they just want to make things working with IP, with IT, with engineering stuff. And we have an amazing opportunity to improve the business, improve the customer experience. And uh, our business is changing. The, the, the way the, the TV are producing content is changing. And uh, I think we can leverage this uh, uh, IP uh, implementation to serve the, the, the end customers. So I think this is the only path we have to take. And we don't have to waste some time to maybe to, uh, to bridge a different implementation. This is not an option. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. Uh, Brian, you get the final word. What, wow. what is your words of wisdom for the day? Well, I'm, you know, Cisco, um, I guess is arguably the largest uh, vendor in the Ames Alliance, um, and uh, certainly the largest IT vendor in the Ames Alliance today. So I think what we want people to understand is we're committed. We're committed to the market. We've made an investment. We've allocated resources to partner, to foster interoperability. Um, we've reallocated. We've made an investment. Um, that's a message that we want to make sure that the industry understands that um, you know, there's a reason why we're here. There's a reason why we're taking an active presence. There's a reason why our booth is in the South Hall. Uh, no offense, uh, hey, Steve. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, that we're committed, right? And, and so um, I, I think that's important um, from our view because it's a little different, right, than Mike, Steve, and Wall, right? We're, we're coming at it a little different lens. The other, the other piece that I would just leave is that we want to make the transition. Uh, Bob, I just, you, you made the comment earlier, and, and I just, we want to make this transition as easy as we can make it. Right, and, and so we don't want to disrupt workflows. We don't want to disrupt what operators have done for years and years and years. And so um, our commitment back to the organization, our commitment from my group inside of our global partner organization is, is really to foster interoperability and names is sit certainly sitting at the heart of that. Well, I think everybody up here would agree with you and I hope that everyone in the audience agrees too that open standards really are the way to drive industry innovation. And I thank everybody for joining us today and please take a look at aimsalliance.org and join as soon as you can. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.